<laughs> Delighted to be here with you all today. First of all, just some boring logistical housekeeping matters. If you can turn the mobile phones off and the fire escape is just behind us, there is no fire drills planned for today. So if there is a fire alarm, I would bolt. Um, actually, I wouldn't. Uh, nice, orderly walking would be gratefully appreciated. So I'm now delighted, as Richard said, to um, introduce Michael. Prior to launching uh, his own venture capital fund here in London, Pro Founders Capital, which by the way has got a phenomenal team behind it, and also Monkey Inferno in San Francisco, he had sold several and built several great companies, including Ringo, Bebo, of course, um, and Birthday Alarm. Uh, a lot of people think that Bebo was his first company uh, to, as a social network that he had created. However, it wasn't. He'd already created Ringo years before. He built it in 90 days, sold it in 90 days for $2 million, which isn't bad for a summer holiday job. In 2008, at the beginning of 2008, he then sold Bebo, as you know, for $850 million. As we know, that's not enough to live on, but it's a very good start. So we're delighted to have him here today. He's a great CEO, great entrepreneur, great visionary. Uh, he's also English, which, uh, which is great and proud that we are. We can do it over here in the UK, currently living in San Francisco. And on behalf of uh, Schroeder's GB Pullhound and BVO, Michael, welcome. Thank you. I'm not sure I can live up to that introduction. But it's uh, <laughs> very flattering nonetheless. <laughs> So, Michael, we've, we're going to go into some pretty um, in-depth in questions ab about business, entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera, today. But if we're going to start with Michael Birch, the person, um, could you just uh, shed some light on maybe some personal details? You know, where were you born? What's your passion? What's your interest outside of business? Uh, I was born in Cambridge, brought up in Hertfordshire, went to university at Imperial College in London, did a degree in physics, wasn't that good at it. Uh, Worked in, in insurance for about 10 years, which is always obviously a good springboard for entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, so that was kind of a complete waste of 10 years, really. But um, it did make me hungry, and it kind of drove me to, to actually do something other than insurance. So maybe it was, was a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure I have any interest outside of um, inter internet businesses and children, really. Okay. Yeah, a positive. That sounded awful, didn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, I have three children, um, <laughs> so uh, th th they take up a lot of time. And then when I'm not with the children, I'm generally working. But uh, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, I don't sort of fly kites or do anything else. What advice would you give to people that want to become world class in whatever field they are doing? So sort of success characteristics of individuals. I think arrogance and stupidity <laughs> probably. I think you have to be arrogant enough to believe you can do it and stupid enough to keep trying when you fail. Um, yeah. we, we certainly didn't succeed. Everything we founded was with myself and my wife, so it's not just me by any means. Yeah. Um, and we, it took us about four years of, of trying to start businesses before we had anything that you could count as a success, which was birthday alarm. Yeah. Um, so we started in 99 and then 2003 um, we sold Ringo and birthday alarm started becoming successful at the same time. Yeah. So persistence is a characteristic that you have continuing. Imagine if you hadn't done, you did the first, second, third, but you'd stop then, you wouldn't have done birthday alarm. And yeah, um, I actually started out, I said I'd do, um, I, I convinced my wife it was a good idea to give up a well-paid job of earning about probably £100,000 a year at the time, which yeah. 10 years ago felt an awfully big amount of money. And um, she was also earning about the same amount. She had left work to have our first child. And I convinced her it was a really good idea for me to leave work as well and start this <laughs> internet business. And I knew nothing about the internet. Mm -hmm. So I bought a book on HTML and started learning it. I thought that's all I need to know. If I can learn HTML, I can build websites. Obviously, that's not true. And I told her, if I haven't started making money after three months, I'll go get another job. <laughs> and three years later, I still hadn't made a penny. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd had a number of conversations along that, that road of, of, should I go and get another job? Yeah. And it really, we, we just sort of came down to the fact that if, um, if it really went belly up, either of <coughs> us, we could both go and live at either of our parents and they would look after us until we could find a job. So we sort of just decided we'd keep going until we literally can't afford to do it anymore. Interesting. Um, not sure that's a wise recommendation for people, <laughs> but it, it worked finally for us. Yeah. Well, Michael, when do you think people, or entrepreneurs, should know when to quit? I mean, is there a point where, for example, if it was going on fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, I mean, is it...? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's so dependent on, on the individuals. But yeah. we, we went into our 
first business, knowing that I didn't really know much, but thinking I could do it. Yeah. And then the first business, we did three businesses that didn't work, and I left that first business um, thinking that, all right, I didn't know anything, but now I know everything I need to know. And I went into the second business and then left that second business realizing I actually knew nothing when I've started that business. And <laughs> then thinking I knew everything. So it's a little bit like waiting for a bus. You think you're, you're there now. It was like, it was a bad idea to begin with, but now I've gone this far, I'll just keep on going. And so we kind of got to this position where we just weren't quitting. Yeah, because you launched Lemon Link Babysitting Circle in Friendly Wills. So what would you say uh, are some of the lessons that you actually did learn from those uh, three ventures that you, you'd launched that you then took forward to? Um, we'd, we'd focus on one thing quite early on, which was um, viral marketing. So one, one thing that we realized we couldn't do was spend money on, on marketing. We didn't have a marketing budget. It was all we could do to, to continue our own cost of living, let alone to plow money into the business. So we focused on viral marketing, and viral marketing is, is quite scientific more than anything else. And um, from us being coming from a science background, we've kind of worked out how to analyze and measure viral growth, and there's quite a lot you can measure. And then we did a lot of experiments, 50-50 trials, and we iterated and mm. experimented on that. So that's really the one thing that we focused on, and that's the one thing that we developed a lot of knowledge and skills in. And that's the one thing that ultimately allowed us to succeed. Um, so from site to site, we just got a lot better at that. And then by the time we did Bebo, we launched it, um, taking everything we'd learned from the previous sites. And we, we hit a million members on day nine. So on the, on the ninth day, we got 350,000 new members on that day alone. Now the problem then was no one ever came back. So out of the million members, we had about 10 people come back. Right. So <laughs> we'd kind of like over perfected this one aspect of growth and <coughs> completely ignored engagement or providing anything <coughs> for them to ever do on the site. Um, so then we actually just stopped doing viral marketing from then on. We not stopped doing it, but we stopped focusing on it. Yeah. And we focused on how to get engagement up. Yeah. And then yeah. we eventually did that. And Bebo, when it was successful, was the most had the highest engagement for per user than any other social network, including MySpace and Facebook. In terms of your career so far, is there anything you wish that you'd known at the beginning uh, that you know now that you could go back to a younger Michael Birch and say, give some advice to? Um, you did very well, but I'm just wondering if there's anything. <laughs> no, I mean, it's hard to think of any, any one thing. I mean, it was kind of knowledge that was acquired over time. It wasn't there wasn't one piece of magical advice that would have meant that we'd have succeeded early on. <coughs> um, so I don't tend to regret anything that's gone in the, on in the past, even though in hindsight I know we could have done it better. Yeah. So I tend to try and just look forward on those things. Yeah. Well, I guess as long as it works out in the end, that's the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, clearly in hindsight <coughs> I could have made it happen a lot more quickly. It took a lot of iterations and a lot of um, um, bad experiments to get to the point where we knew somewhat what we were doing. Um, Michael, you're a great entrepreneur, as I mentioned, um, and now you uh, work with ProFounders Capital, so your job is to find great entrepreneurs. Um, so you're a good person to ask. What would you say is some of the inherent skills or personality type of a phenomenal world-class entrepreneur? Um, well, we, I mean, obviously, meet a lot. I think probably everyone here does a lot of entrepreneurs, and it's, um, it's always interesting trying to work out whether they are a great entrepreneur or not. Mm. And uh, I mean, it's obviously <coughs> the key thing for any investor. And you tend to invest a lot more in the person, potentially, than the, than the company or the idea that they have. Yeah. I wish I could actually just invest in people and not ideas. <laughs> and say, I back you for the rest of your life, and <laughs> anything you do, I'll get 20% of it for investing so much money in you. But um, unfortunately, you can't do that. But when I, you I would take a cash lump sum if you want to take 20% <laughs> <of that training. laughs> Yeah, I, I need to know you better to know whether you're one of those great entrepreneurs. But, um, you know, when you meet someone, you, you, you can often quite quickly <coughs> determine. I, mean, I, I tend to like people who are very enthusiastic, yeah. um, uh, a huge amount of energy, a great amount of original ideas, people who you can talk to and they're just constantly feeding back insights and thoughts and ideas and come up with, with original concepts. Uh, and when you do find one of those people, they say you just want to try and back them. And, um, and for me, it's important that I just like the person. I like to work with people that I enjoy being yeah. with. And so if I meet someone who I think is probably very talented, but I just don't click personality-wise, then I quickly lose interest. Yeah. On, on a related uh, subject, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs or CEOs of media companies uh, all have uh, reasonably limited cash reserves, but a great need to get a phenomenal management team 
around them. So uh, one of the great tactic I understand you took is you uh, you married so to you and <laughs> <laughs> so it's not very scalable. That that's one. not very scalable yeah. exactly. <laughs> and some of us may already be married. So um, so what other um, strategies or you know how can CEOs or entrepreneurs with low cash reserves surround themselves by great management? I guess you have to be a great salesperson. I mean yeah. that's not something that we really did. Obviously <laughs> we um, we set out to again because we are financially constrained. Just we knew we had to do everything ourselves. We knew we had to get involved marketing working because we didn't have a marketing budget. I knew I had to develop everything myself because I couldn't afford to hire a developer. Yeah. Um, and really, th they were the only things that we needed to do. If we could develop and, and the site and do VAR marketing and grow, then we didn't need much cash. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think there's different types of entrepreneurs and I, I tend to favor the ones that kind of have the whole package and can do it themselves yeah. rather than someone who comes to me and says, I've got a great idea, but I can only hire a great team around me. I'm going to make a great success around me. Like, yeah, if only, right? right? It's, yeah. it's kind of not that easy to do. Yeah. Um, so sort of prototype with... Prototype with and, yeah, I mean, the, the obvious thing is to be a co-founder. So if, if sure. you have half the package, you can still be a great success, clearly, and most people do that. Yeah. And they find someone who's got the other half. So if they're not technical, they find someone who is technical yep. and make them a co-founder and then go it together. Yep. And you're both willing to take nominal money or no money until you get yeah. it a success. Just talking about that Monkey Inferno, for example, I understand that you try and replicate the early days of Bebo with five or, se five or six engineers around a, a table. I imagine it's probably a nicer table, but um, right. it, does that work in terms of uh, incubation of ideas and sort of getting... I don't know yet. We'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> we, uh, Monkey Inferno, people probably don't know what that is. It's a, some crazy-ass name for a, a company, but it's... a. Uh, okay. It's a sort of a labs company. So I don't like the word incubator, but we're, we're developing our own ideas. And um, we realize that the next idea we prob come up with may not be the next big thing. So we want to try and experiment with multiple ideas, not do big launches of each, but just put them out there, yep. find if they work, and then iterate on them. So the idea there is, is really to go back to what we were doing before. Before, it was myself, my wife in a bedroom, kind of doing them serially. Um, but now we can scale a little bit more, we can hire people and do multiple ideas in parallel and try and find the, kind of <laughs> the next big one. It's not about finding five big ideas, it's about finding one big idea amongst five ideas. Sure. sure. Um, so we'll find out whether it works. We've been doing it for about six months and we're about to launch our first, I would say, real startup since Bebo, which is called uh, Jolitix, which is a political networking site. And that's going live initially in Ireland this week. Right. We're going to see how it does in Ireland and then launch it in the UK and then the US. Um, Michael, you're in a good position because you can actually fund these uh, um, ideas yourself. But I heard you speaking at a Glasshouse Events event back in 2008 where you were saying that a lot of entrepreneurs fall into the trap of trying to raise, spend all the time raising finance in the early days when there's an actual fact they should be doing what you're saying, which is actually creating a, a business. Um, to then you know, show the value that then get the money later on. Is that I think it's about being realistic when you can get finance. I don't think you, can, yeah. you can't get an MBA, write a business plan and walk into a VC firm and expect them to give you millions of dollars. It's just sure. not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, you know, get, getting caught into that too early it is very time consuming. And if, if it's to no avail, then you've just wasted a huge amount of time yeah. and actual money because you could have spent that time doing actual business development. Um, so I would say focus if you're in that position on building the business until you, you're at a point where you have the credibility to demonstrate that it's a success yeah. or could be a success. <laughs> because both Birthday Alarm and Bebo you're quite unfashionable in a certain extent but to a certain extent because you were actually cash positive from the start, I believe. So does that um, you know is is that something that you um, decided that although because I think when you raised finance with Bebo, you had s around seven people, you were cash positive. So why did you decide to raise finance as opposed to going organic? We weren't really, I mean, we were not making any money for four years before Birthday Alarm started making money. Okay. So it's not <laughs> right. quite true in that sense. Birthday Alarm was making about three, four million dollars a year when we started Bebo. Yeah. So that made starting Bebo relatively easy because we could put all that money back into Bebo. So we did self-finance that and grow it to seven people, which isn't a huge team when we are cash flow positive. And then we, we ultimately, <laughs> I get asked a lot why we raise VC, and I kind of raise VC because I've never done it before, <laughs> which is the honest truth. Um, you know, people have always talked about VC, is it good, is it bad? And I thought, I need to experience this. I need to know what it's like to have 
raise VC. So I thought we'll mm. go and raise VC, find out whether it's a good idea. <laughs> I mean, it turned out well for us, um, clearly, because we had a good exit. But um, And I learned a huge amount from it. And I, w I wanted to find out whether I get better advice. Um, we got it from Bolton Capital, which was at the time known as Benchmark UK, um, which was a tier one VC firm. So it kind of added to our credibility. It did make it a little easier to hire certain people into the business. Um, and then obviously the, f the funding did allow us to accelerate growth a little bit yeah. more. So we sort of hired faster than we would have done if we were trying to stay break even. Got it. Okay. And because you've been on now both sides uh, of the investment fence, so any advice for CEOs or founders of companies that want to get uh, good VC money? Yeah, I go to Pro Founders Capital, <laughs> and uh, that's the best firm. So. Dot com, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Shameless. Absolutely. Any other gem? <laughs> <laughs> well, self-plugging gem. No, not that I can think of. Okay. Um, Michael, you're also known as a, fut uh, as a futurist as well. Uh, Ronald Cohen wrote a uh, book called Second Bounce of the Ball, where obviously you know, we are operating in today's bounce, today's market, but you need to also predict where the next bounce of the ball will be, which is on the horizon, the next uh, opportunities coming around, uh, around the corner. So as you mentioned, you, um, you, know, you got social networking very, very early. You also got viral back at Birthday Alarm right. uh, very, very early. I think other people were beginning to play with it, Tickle, etc. but you transformed your business from viral. So you can identify things early. So any advice for other CEOs that are wanting to make sure they're keeping their finger on the pulse of what's coming up next so they can align their businesses for that? Um, <laughs> I always get asked, what's the next big thing? And it's like, We've got that coming up. Yeah, if I knew <laughs> that, I, you know, I'd be doing it. Um, <laughs> uh, political networking, I hope, but we'll find out. The, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I was never trying to be the next big thing. That wasn't kind of our goal when we were doing social networking. I did social networking because I saw in 2003 Friendster.com, which yeah. you're probably familiar with, yeah. which was kind of the, the pioneer in social networking. It was a huge success, certainly in California. At the time, it had a million members, which seemed like a crazy high number. <laughs> and then you look back at it now, and Facebook's at 500 million. It seems nothing. Um, and I went on the site. Someone had told me about it. And I spent about half an hour on it. And I just thought, this is amazing. And I thought, I want to do this. This is so fun. Social networking is great. So I just started building it. So I, I would say building something that you think is really cool is a great way to go. Yeah. And um, <coughs> you know, if it turns out to be the next great big thing, then great for you. But I think trying to spend your entire life chasing the next big thing is maybe just a bad idea. Mm. Just do something that you're passionate about, that, that you think you can build a better version of what's already there and, and try and turn that into a business. And yeah. You know, if you're not, uh, our nature was always to, to spend a few weeks building it, put it live and see how it looked. Mm. Um, it's obviously different if you spend three years building it and $10 million and then find out that it was a crap idea in the first place. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> if, you, if you sort of took, took the approach that we took, it was a fun way of doing it. Yeah, because I think you and Sochi came up with Bieber partially because you just wanted to share photographs um, or contact Be with your friends back So Bieber, okay. interestingly, started out not as a social networking site. It was a self-updating address book, very similar to Plaxo, but it was purely web-based. And our very first idea that we went live with back in 99 was a website called LemonLink, which you right. referenced earlier, which was an online self-updating address book. So mm -hmm. I actually kind of did it as a fun project. I wanted to take everything I'd learned about file marketing and apply it to the very first viral idea we had and see what would happen now. Yeah. And so when we did it back in 99, it had a viral factor of about 0.7, which is quite good, which means each 100 people get 70 and 70 get mm. another 0.7 of 70 joining. And then when we launched it um, that much later, we had a viral factor of about 2.5, which is the highest we've ever had, which means 100 people get 250 people to join mm. and the 250 get two and a half times that. So each iteration, each generation, it was just multiplying like crazy. Yeah. So it was just, I sort of did it as this fun experiment. But I knew at the time that self-updating address books don't work because the reality is you create this address book and you invite all your friends to enter their contact details and about 10% of them do it. So you end up with this address book with 10% of your contacts in it, which is like no good to anyone. <laughs> so <laughs> you never go back because it's pointless. Yeah. But it had this amazing, everyone thought it was a good idea at the time, so they'd kind of do it and tell their friends about it. Michael, talking about, if we can, just going back to what we were talking about earlier, which is what is the next big idea on the web? What's the next big thing? If I can ask you that again, just to press. Um, because, you know, social networking came, uh, we've always been, you know, it's a human need to be social and to engage and share 
thoughts with friends and family and colleagues. So is that a sort of a one-off opportunity, you think? Sort of, is there any other human need that the web hasn't met at this point? Uh, is that a different way of trying <laughs> to ask the same question you don't want to answer? Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the human need to communicate has been addressed from the web from day one. I mean, it's yeah. social networking has just sort of defined a term around it and yeah. created certain expectations of how that should happen. But email is still the single biggest app on the web, and that's all about communication. So I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to try and think a human needs not addressed, but um, I think they've all been addressed in some form or another. And there's a lot of ideas that kind of um, iterate and reinvent around the same concept. But I mean, you look, you look at Facebook and everyone thought Facebook had been one and there's nothing else to do. Like, what can yeah. you do? No one's going to beat them in social networking. And then along comes Twitter taking <coughs> quite a different angle. It's referenced as a social network, which it is of types. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they've become maybe not as big as Facebook, but they've certainly become the, sure. the next most hype thing. Yeah. Um, so it's very easy to kind of think that everything's been done. And then every week you see another idea and think, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I should have thought of that one. So th there's uh, an infinite number of ideas, and I, s I believe firmly that there's more ideas still to be done than have been done so far, and more opportunities today than there probably ever has been. Mm. Uh, and it's certainly a lot easier to execute on them. And I think the, the various platforms, the Facebook platform, the, the certainly mobile platforms, and TV, which is really only now just becoming a platform, is going to be huge. So the number of opportunities to do different things is is, is certainly out there. Michael, you and uh, Sochi uh, built Bebo and uh, did a phenomenal job with it. W what were some of the things that you got right in that process to get such a, a great exit and um, build such a great business? I know. I mean, surviving was the, the one thing that <laughs> had, had we done things differently, we probably wouldn't have survived long enough to have success. Um, so I, th I think doing everything on a low budget and doing it yourself is, is a great way for a new entrepreneur to start, as I mentioned earlier. Um, mm. I don't know. I mean, there's certainly things I'd do differently. And, you know, as successful as Bebo was, we ultimately actually lost. We didn't win. We, we sold it because we were not going to win. Um, it's Facebook one, social networking. Um, it just happened to be such a big space that you could be number two or three and still exit for a lot of money. Um, so... I don't know. Did I answer your question? Probably not. Uh, no, I think it was uh, it was well answered. Just on on that point, um, of Facebook was always going to win. I, uh, that's interesting because Bebo still has millions of raving fans, and, and on TechCrunch blog, for example, Roby N N N N. Oh, uh, Roby. Yeah. You have heard of her <laughs> 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 on April 9th. Excuse the grammar; it's not great, but it's not bad. Um, this year, April 9th, this year, wrote Bebo is amazing. You get to write about yourself, make apps, and etc., and make your own skin. On Facebook, it's just a pile of games. When I go onto Facebook, it's just boring. But if I go onto Bebo, it's fun. I get to talk to friends and so on. So let's say it again and this is in caps, leave Facebook and come back to Bebo. I could go on all day about Bebo. I did check to see if there was a Roby N, 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 Birch in the family and there, there wasn't, so no, it's obviously. No. The, um, and there's a, the, I could go on and on about this. There's, there's a lot on there. Claire, on April 9th, Bebo is way better than Facebook. There's just nothing to do on Facebook. Most people go onto Facebook to play Farmville. So, you know, you had users that loved it. You could personalize skins. You could use Nike branded skins. You could do all of these things. And you didn't bombard users on their profile page with advertising. So. Why, after you left, did Facebook get such a market share from Bebo? Um, I think Facebook is just a big wrapper for Farmville, ultimately. <laughs> but, you know. um, it's, it's, I mean, it was winning prior to us selling, which is kind of why we sold. We, we were being flat for six months prior to selling, um, and it wasn't for lack of trying to grow. It was just evident that we'd done that. And we've had spectacular growth for a long time, yeah. and then we'd gone flat. And I wasn't confident that I could get it to grow again. Um, and Facebook were, since their inception, really had pretty much straight line growth. I mean, they've been as, as steady as anything you've, I've seen in terms of growth. Mm. And we, we'd become uh, we'd become a very young demographic on Bebo, and it was kind of skewing younger over time. And I think part of the problem, and this is kind of ironic, is that we, we were reasonably open. When you registered, you were private by default because um, we didn't want to suddenly expose you to the world. But then most people would actually, in reality, opt into making it open. And then you could see anyone else who was open and comment on their profile, and it became this quite open network. Mm -hmm. And that had a problem because people would interact with other people that maybe they didn't really know that well. 
and it, it sort of started becoming young, so the older people got put off. So then it became even younger, and then that put even people only slightly older off. And it just ended up becoming this teenage network, right. which wasn't something we were trying to do. I actually designed it as a tool that I would find useful. Yeah. Obviously, I'm either very childish or just got <laughs> it wrong. Um, and it became very popular with teenagers. So we'd become ultimately a niche social network, which mm -hmm. wasn't the intent. We wanted to be a generic social network. Yeah. And Facebook, because it had been, a, I feel, a, a closed network, and ironically, they're now becoming open, yeah. um, ha had this thing where you, when you logged in, the whole world that you saw on Facebook was your friends. So by definition, it was people like you. Mm. Um, and everyone felt at home, whether you were a teenager or a grandmother, you, you went in and you felt comfortable in that environment. Um, and we were trying to be too many different things in one big open environment. Um, and so I think we, we just kind of, we, we'd lost our initial mission and it's really hard to turn a community around once it's taken a certain direction. I often yeah. draw analogies with bars, you know, if you go into a bar and it's a wine bar, then, and you don't like wine bars, you're not gonna go in it. Um, and so that initial community kind of defines what type of community it is. Right. And then if it starts taking a certain turn, it starts becoming a dive bar. Mm. Although it was a dive bar, but it's very hard to make it a classy bar again. You know, it just mm. gets defined by its clientele. Right. And so we kind of got in this trap. Okay. So it's a shifting demographic that caused the problem fundamentally. I think, I think potentially, yeah. And um, you know, we'd, we we our initial vision for for Bebo was to be the the product quality and um, experience utility experience of Facebook, yeah. but with the kind of fun and self expression of MySpace. We wanted mm. to be something in between, hoping that it would be better than the sum of the parts. Yeah. And I think we succeeded it in that to some degree, and I think maybe the thing we went wrong on was just being too open. We should have forced it to be friends only. Right, okay. So do you think there's still an opportunity for a, uh, a new entrant to, as you said, hit that middle ground between the sort of the f functionality of Facebook in terms of you can't change skins and that type of thing, and, and the playfulness and music of MySpace? Um, possibly, it's just that much harder now to get a foothold in it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we grew much more quickly in the UK than America, and that's, I think, because MySpace and, and increasingly Facebook at the time were so entrenched in America mm. that we couldn't get a foothold. And I think anyone launching any sort of social network, generic social network now, trying to get a foothold is going to be quite difficult. I think yeah. Twitter succeeded because it was so different. It wasn't trying to be... You know, Bebo was too similar. It was sort of between those two. Right. And Twitter was so different that they managed. So I think the only way of really doing it now is to be fundamentally quite different. Yeah, yeah. So because, as you said, Bebo was so uh, interlinked with that demographic shift downwards, is that the reason why you decided not to buy it? Because, uh, as you know, uh, you sold it for 850 million. It just got sold to Criterion for 10 uh, million dollars. So you weren't tempted to. Um, we thought about it briefly, but it was, um, and I think it is an absolute bargain at 10 million. Yeah. And I believe it sold for less than 10 million. Yeah. But um, it, it just felt like a step back and I wanted to do something new and, and original. Um, so we, we'd, we'd already had a number of ideas and we're doing political networking as opposed to social networking. So it's sort of somewhat a related feel, yeah. a little more serious than what we were doing with Bebo. But yeah. um, I just kind of more excited about looking forward rather than what I felt would have been going backwards. So I know you still um, care about the Bebo brand. So this isn't a free consultation for Criterion, but what, what advice would you give to them in order to get Bebo back up the value chain? Um, well, I, I do actually know that I've met the new owners because they're, they're one block away from our office. So, oh. <laughs> so I'm sort of starting to speak to them and find out what they're planning on doing because it's kind of fun to be tangentially yeah. part of it without owning it. Um, I think the opportunity is to try and embrace the one thing that it was, which was a, a kind of young social network, yeah. whereas we were to some degree fighting it. At the end, we sort of embraced <coughs> it. Mm. Um, I think if you just embrace that and, and cater entirely towards that demographic, yeah. there is an opportunity, because it already has that foothold, to create something between MySpace and Facebook for that demographic mm. of, of kind of teens from 13 to probably 18 and, um, and just be really good at that and cater to them. I mean, pe people do find Facebook a little boring at times. Yeah. It is a quite dry experience. Yeah. So I don't think it's for everyone. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because Business Week um, says uh, 
the price AOR pay for Bebo included $766 million of goodwill. So goodwill, obviously part of that is branded. What, what advice? I never know what goodwill means. Well, I don't quite, that's what I'm actually asking you. What is goodwill? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should call it MBA. Um, but assuming part of that is brand and the other brilliant stuff that you probably programmed, what I what's the art of building a phenomenal global brand in this digital era? Um, I think it's just focusing on building a great product. <laughs> I yeah. think the brand follows the product. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the better the user experience is, the more committed and uh, you can get the user base, the more crazy they are saying that, that your product's better than the other sites. They, can be, they, they certainly take a great sense of ownership, especially in social networking sites. Mm. I mean, as you mentioned, there was a couple of references there. Mm. I mean, there is a core base of incredibly dedicated and loyal um, quite a big core base of, of yeah. dedicated and loyal Bebo fans. Yeah. And um, you know, if you can just grow that and feed off that and get more and more of that, um, then, then the brand kind of follows. I'm certainly yeah. not a great brand builder. That's not my okay. kind of thing. I wouldn't yeah. consider myself a branding guy. Yeah. I just like to try and build good technology products. Yeah. Um, do you think you got a good price for Bebo? <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, a lot of digital companies have, um, you know, bought startup media companies with not that much success or a lot of challenge. If you look at, for example, uh, Friends Reunited, uh, Skype, and some of those. So, what do large corporates need to do in order to get these acquisitions to work, or is it just fundamentally most some, most will have problems? Uh, they need to buy the right ones, probably. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of them were just bad choices to buy. Okay. Um, I mean, Skype actually was quite a good buy, and it did quite well. Yeah. And it's been spun off now again as a, I think they make 500 million a year. Yeah. I think it, you know, it's, it's a great business. It wasn't a particularly good fit when eBay bought them. Right. Because it wasn't. They, they had some crazy notion that you could, you know, phone, or the person selling the goods. I mean, it's like. <laughs> well, you could just put a Skype link and do that. You didn't right. even buy the company. <laughs> it, like it didn't really make any sense as a fit. Um, so probably why they ended up selling it. So I, I think buying something that's um, the right product, that's <coughs> kind of a core fit to what you're doing, yeah. is, is probably a good idea. And I'm not sure Bebo was a great fit for AOL. And yeah. at the time, they were kind of very much reinventing themselves, considering mm. spinning out from Time Warner. Mm. Um, and then the, they changed CEO soon after Bebo was acquired. And then the new CEO had a very different vision for what AOL should be. So yeah. um, Bebo itself got marginalized and really never had an opportunity to succeed within AOL anyway. Interesting. Um, but certainly buying the right companies and buying any startup can be tough if the cultures are so different. Mm. You know, big corporates tend to have a very different culture. And uh, if you subsume it within that um, corporate culture, it can often kill um, the startup. And a lot of the startup um, people that made it a success will leave anyway because they don't want to work for a big corporate, um, mm. maybe Google have been more successful than most at doing that. Yeah. It's trying to maintain that startup culture. Because yeah. I think AOL obviously big in 80s and 90s for instant messaging, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it was their first pure play social network that they'd acquired or played with. It was your third. So is it a lack of um, do you think experience in that? I just don't think they were committed enough okay. to, to make that a success. I mean, they honestly, it seems they didn't really know what to do with AOL. I mean, they built the Messenger. They built um, AOL Messenger in-house. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge success. It was a huge homegrown success. Because I think it was a north of 100 million, even at the time that Bebo bought them, active users. Um, and so huge success and great innovative product at the time. But they never really knew what to do with it outside of IM. They didn't know how mm -hmm. to extend it and make something else of it. And I think the vision was that plugging a social network in with, with AIM had the ability to, to kind of leverage the AIM membership into a social network. But the challenge of that is that it's very hard to kind of make someone join a social network. Mm. Like if you drop someone in a social network, they probably don't want to be there. Yeah. They have to kind of get pulled in by their friends and want to be there for that reason. Okay. So c large companies can innovate through acquisition, but as you said, they've got to do choose the right ones and make it a focus, not a... Right, absolutely. Right. Um, talking about social networking, like you just, you just mentioned there, what, um, and I, I know you get asked all the time, as you said earlier, about what's the next big thing on the web. So if I can ask you a slight deviation of that, what's the next big thing in social networking? I mean, you mentioned Facebook, obviously it's now opening itself up through Facebook Connect, presumably, but is there any other trends you're seeing within social networking? Um, 
Well, the, I guess one of the things that always attracted me to social networking, well, that made me so excited early on, yeah. was that if, if you take a social network, you can add pretty much any product you think of and plug it into a social network. And that's not really true for any other type of internet business. So you can, um, I'm trying to think of some of the things that uh, Facebook has started doing recently. I mean, games, social gaming plugged in and became this huge industry in its own right. And yeah. Facebook, they were a bit slow off the mark, but now they're sort of starting to say, hey, we want a percentage of the activity going on there. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think they're talking about lending, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending. I mean, you, you know, well, that fits in. And now they're into financial services. So you, you take any sort of area you like and you can kind of drop it in. So, you know, social networks can become... The, the social network itself can become this middleman for all these other businesses. And Facebook Connect has, has been very successful. I mean, the types of sites that use Connect, you would never imagine. You never mm -hmm. think of them as a social network in their own right. Mm -hmm. But they plug into Connect, and suddenly it, it actually makes quite a lot of sense yeah. having your friend network in the context of something that you would never think of, like gambling, obviously not very popular in the US, but right. well, not very allowed in the US. Um, you know, gambling, peer to peer gambling is, is great fun, fits mm -hmm. into a social network. So that's the kind of exciting thing about being a network owner is that you can drop anything you like in, but you have to be, you, you know, you have to be a big network, mm. and that's the challenge is getting that big network. So mm. I think that's the ultimate value of it. And people criticise Facebook for saying this, they're not making enough money. I mean, they're actually making reasonably decent money now, but I think their their focus has been let's not make money in the short term. Let's just focus on building the network because the value is there in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. So, because a lot of publishers, I think, are actually trying to create their own social network as opposed to, I mean, going into the connect thing. Would you suggest that that's not the right move for publishers and CEOs? That not everybody needs their own social network? Um, I think you can create a certain element of community on a site. You're not really going to create right. any sort of social network that competes with <laughs> Twitter or Facebook. Twitter, yeah, um, right. So, I think uh, certainly if you're a publisher of content, it's a lot easier to kind of leverage existing yeah. social networks and allow your content to spread throughout them. Um, Michael, just going back, I think uh, you mentioned about gaming and, and Bebo being obviously a, a young demographic. Do you do, would you have thought that a gaming company would would be good to have acquired Bebo? Then surely that would it could have been. I, I kind of wonder whether Zynga would at one point because um, it seemed to be kind of good fit. That was when they were going through their um, their marital troubles with Facebook. Yeah. Um, but the problem is, then they're kind of conflicted, and right. Facebook probably wouldn't want to talk with them because <laughs> they're a network owner as well. So I don't yeah. know, may, maybe it would have been a funny fit, but yeah. uh, I think there's a lot of, I think it's a good opportunity. Be Bebo mon monetization wise is, is yeah. certainly the gaming channel. Absolutely. Um, talking about Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, as you alluded to earlier, um, on July 21st, 2010, uh, mentioned that Facebook now has 500 million users and half a billion is not a bad number. Um, <laughs> What do you think Facebook will look like in three to five years' time? I mean, do you think to be competitive, social networks need to do more than just social networking? Um, it's really hard to define yeah. what social networking even is. Right. I mean, what is it? You're Communication the, the between kid. friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they'll do a lot more than social networking, but it will all be within a social network. Yeah. I mean, we, as I was mentioning, plugging you can plug anything you like into it, yeah. and I think they'll plug more and more things into it, or allow yeah. other people to plug into it. Yeah. Um, and in certain cells as kind of a middleman, so that they take a percentage of anything that's going on. Yeah. Um, so I think they're going to evolve probably a lot in that direction. Um, but yeah, it's fun. I mean, you can just, the, the number of ideas for things we thought of doing at Bebo was just unlimited. It's, yeah. it's the exciting thing. There's just so many things you can tag on to a social network once you've got the network. Absolutely. As you said, it's fun being the network owner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what about sort of the, I know Facebook is looking at, for example, uh, its own currency, virtual currencies. Do you think the banking route is going to be somewhere that peer-to-peer -peer lending, that's going to be a significant thing within social networks? Um, it could be. I mean, the, the currency thing, they're now, I think they're live with Facebook credits and doing it and trying to get yeah. all the games to switch over to it. Um, I mean, the, the, the kind of holy grail of, of micropayments on the internet, which was sort of done in the dot, you know, the web 1.0 days, never really materialised and... I think within the context of social networking, it can. So I think them being, um, you know, having an account and having money in an account on Facebook and then using it to transact elsewhere on the web, yeah. certainly with Facebook Connect sites, is a very real opportunity for them. Yeah. As you said, they're trying the microcredits. One thing that I've noticed in doing the research on, on you today um, is that you you're a big believer in innovating just trial and error. It doesn't seem like you're afraid of trial and error, beta testing in all the environments you're in. Right. Is that Yeah, accurate? it's fun to try stuff. <laughs> 
It's embarrassing if there's, you put a big spotlight on it and try it and then it fails. So <laughs> <laughs> or I a few hundred to, million pounds behind it. Yeah, I, don't know. yeah <laughs> I prefer to kind of try things and um, not make a big fanfare about things. And then if it works, then you kind of focus on it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, trying stuff out so is one of the most fun things to do. Absolutely. Because when it works, it's obviously very exciting. So last question, uh, what's, what's next for, uh, for you, Michael, apart from uh, questions from the floor? <laughs> Um, next for us, we're, um, um, and we were very focused on Monkey Inferno in the US and Pro Founders Capital in, in the UK. Yeah. They're kind of the two main things. Um, we've, I mean, we've done various other things. We're actually opening a private members club in San Francisco in about a year and a half, kind of Soho House equivalent. That's kind, okay. of, kind of a real world social network. <laughs> fun. So that's kind of fun. Um, and I've been, I've been quite heavily involved with just one charity, Charity Water in New York. Um, in terms of s donating money, but more importantly, um, building their website, helping them build their website, My Charity Water, which yeah. is a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising network, yeah. um, which has been pretty successful so far, but continuing to work on it. So that, that's been quite enjoyable. And I took yeah. my daughter to Ethiopia with the charity, which was huge <coughs> now. It was 10 years old last year. So that was kind of pretty fun. So it's kind of doing various other things, which, um, but trying to pursue everything that we enjoy <laughs> doing. Yeah. So all the startups we do are startups that we like doing. Everyone yeah. we work with are people we like working with. Yeah. So, um, so someone said to me when uh, a few years ago, said if you don't enjoy the process, the journey, there's no point doing something. And yeah. that kind of really resonated as being true. So now everything I do is because it's so often you plan to do things and you're doing it because you want the end goal. Right. But the end goal is kind of a momentary thing. But the journey getting there can be years. So if you don't enjoy that process, there's no point doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And so we kind of, I kind of take that in everything I do and make sure that I enjoy what I'm doing and who I'm with. Very good advice. Michael, thank you very much indeed for uh, your interview with that. So now we can uh, open it up to the floor. I think we've got um, microphones either side of the room. So if you could just speak clearly, that'd be fantastic. Uh, the first question, let's go straight to the back, far left, please. Hi, thanks very much for sharing all that, Michael. I um, wanted to ask you a question about Foursquare. So you, you talked about one of the um, potential faults of Bebo was being too open, and Foursquare seems to be even more closed than Facebook because you're sharing your location with all the people that you connect to. And personally, I've probably had the most invites for a new social network this year to Foursquare out of anything new that's up and coming. I was wondering um, what your thoughts were on Foursquare and generally the location-based social networking space and whether you think that's going to continue to be big in the future? Uh, I think it will. I don't know whether Foursquare are going to own that space. They've got the advantage of being the first certainly notable um, site or service, really. It's not even such a site um, in there. So they've certainly got an advantage of being first. Uh, I'm pretty excited by location-based services. I mean, it's um, the whole app market on the phone is new. The whole concept of being able to have knowledge of someone's location in real time um, is certainly fairly new. So I think there's a lot can be done with that. I think there's a lot of people trying to compete with them. So I feel it's a little bit the kind of, a little bit like social networking was in 2003 where, you know, there were probably a hundred startups doing social networks when we did our first one called Ringo and it wasn't evident who was going to succeed and it ended up being none of them. So <laughs> MySpace kind of was starting at around that time. They ended <coughs> up being successful and that got superseded. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what happens, whether um, Foursquare make it or someone else who's, who comes along makes it. And, um, but interestingly, with social networks, all of the successful ones were new businesses. They weren't started by the big businesses. I think the only slight success was Orkut that was started internally in Google. Um, so, you know, and that seems to be happening again with location services that the bigger ones are, are like that. I know sites like Yelp are adding location. There's been a lot of talk about Facebook adding location. Um, but I think there's a good chance that the, the big success is actually going to be another company and not just a, a tag-on feature to um, one of the existing networks. The lady in the blue, Sahar, I believe. Um, so what was your motivation in 98, 99 when you left your job? Was it because you thought you could make a lot of money to the internet? Were you looking for more excitement? What, what was the reason why you sort of um, I mainly thought it, it was be a lot more fun than doing insurance <laughs> was my main <laughs> <laughs> the kind of truth. I actually always wanted to start my own thing, and um, 
so I did, I did it wasn't only insurance, but I did freelance um, computer programming for about 10 years after university. And my, my father was an entrepreneur and uh, started, he, he would invent simple products, it's obviously pre-internet days, simple products, consumer products, and try and get someone to market them. And, and he had some success with some dental products. He got um, uh, wisdom to, to market one of the products. And I remember as a child seeing it on the sh shelves in Boots, and I was very excited that my dad's invention product was on the shelves in Boots. And so I always kind of had this thing that entrepreneurship was great and I wanted to do my own thing. And then I, when I left university, I, I really didn't have that much self-confidence as a person. Um, I, I could never have sat in front of an audience like this and spoken, for example. And um, and also didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't think I had any special skills that would enable me to do anything. So as time went on and the internet started surfacing, I was actually quite late to even realizing it existed. And then I thought, you know, I can program, I can build websites. And um, I just thought, I've got to do it. So this is the time to do it. So I just thought, I've got to have a go at this. So the temptation was just too much not to try. And uh, as soon as I did it, I, you know, within a day, I thought, this is great. I love this. I'm sitting at home, not making any money and, uh, and building stuff and learning. And, you know, I loved learning, always did. And here I was learning all day long and programming. And I thought it was immense fun. So it was, um, it was great. I mean, I, I was happy from the moment I chose to do it. And prior to that, I'd been freelancing, working by the hour. And I just entered this crazy mental state of like, my hour was worth so much. I think it was like 60 pounds, I can't remember. And I'd work as many hours as I could because that meant more. I wouldn't take holiday because that means I'd earn less. And I was like, I wasn't even that bothered about money, <coughs> but I just kind of got into this state where it was like I was watching time and time kind of drove my life. And then as soon as I gave that up and sat at home doing stuff in my own time, I worked harder than I ever did and enjoyed it way more. And then just that's why I kind of never wanted to actually go back and get another job. Enjoying things, good advice. So thank you. So could you tell us something about the um, the selling process for Bebo? Well, presumably people were talking to you about wanting to buy it from fairly early on. At what point did you start saying to people, well, actually, yes, we we might sell it if you're able to to give us this price? And uh, w when did you appoint an advisor that that kind of thing? Um, so we we ended up selling it. Um, it closed in May and we announced it, I think, in March. And we started talking in December about selling it. So it wasn't a huge time frame from beginning to end. And we appointed, I think, we appointed Alan and Co. with the advisors. And I think that was around December time. So we appointed them quite early on. Um, I mean, we, we'd had people approach us from the very early days, around the time that we got VC, before VC, about buying us. and. You know, I, I just didn't want to sell it whilst we were growing well. Um, and so w whilst, it was, whilst it was doing well and I was having fun, I wanted to keep hold of the business. And, and then it sort of became more evident that, um, A, that it wasn't, we, we were going to struggle to continue to grow. And there was a chance that we could have got it on the growth curve again, but it was becoming harder. And also wasn't actually enjoying it as much. So it kind of violated my must-have-fun policy in life. And, um, <laughs> and so it was for those two reasons that we kind of decided that maybe it was a good time to sell. And uh, we got approached by AOL, I think it was around December time, and then Alan and co went out discreetly to other companies to, to, to see if there was other interests. And there was some, some actually quite good other interests, but AOL continued to actually be the favourites. Um, and then we just thought, that's it, let's just do it. It's, it's, I think we were at that stage of the business to sell it. But it was, we didn't set out, we didn't start the business to sell it. That was never kind of a, let's start this business and flip it. That was never kind of our goal in life. Mm. But pe people who approach in those early days, so would you just say, well, there's some we're just not interested? Yes. Or yeah. We'd have the occasional meeting more because there could have been other opportunities and we wanted to, you know, we thought down the road we may want to, so let's build some relationships. But generally we would, we would be pretty cold to them, yeah. So at the back. If you could just do it in the microphone, I'd really appreciate it. We're recording for afterwards. A little bit about pro-founders. Did you, did you set that up just because you can or because you, you see there's a funding gap? And I'd be interested in sort of uh, your perspective on funding in the US versus in the UK. Sure. We, um, so so pro-founders were set up by myself, Johnny Goodwin, um, Brent Hoberman, and Peter, Peter Jubin. So four entrepreneurs that had started and, and sold businesses. And um, all four of us would constantly be approached by people, knew a lot of people, 
with potential investment opportunities and it was very difficult for us to to take the time to look at all these opportunities and, and give them the amount of, of, of time that would be required to actually make a, a good judgment call on it. It just became very time consuming. So really it was kind of to satisfy that need is that we wanted to make investments, we wanted to do a good job of it and not just like, you know, betting on a horse and throw some money there because we think it's a good idea at the time. And so we thought, well, let, let's get together and, and hire a couple of people full time that we know and respect and, and have them actually meet with everyone and take time and, and make a, a better call and then we'll get together on, on the phone and then decide um, which ones we actually do want to invest in. So it's really a way of kind of formalizing that process. Um, at the same time, and we're, we're doing it because, I mean, we do want to in support entrepreneurship and encourage others to do it and there is a bit of a funding gap. So, you know, there's a certain social entrepreneurship goal to it, but we wouldn't do it if we didn't think it was a, a good business and that we could make money asset. And, and the, the market that we aim at is, is kind of post-angel and pre-VC. Um, we don't want to pigeon our, ourselves and say we're only just going to do that. Um, and it really depends on the company and the opportunity. But we try and find the, you know, the future successes earlier than a VC may step in and try and back them at the right stage for probably a little bit less money than a VC would. Ask the other question about the US and the UK. Um, I'm not sure there's a huge difference other than there's probably more people and more money in the US. I think the process and the procedure is very similar. Um, but there's also a lot more companies in the US. It's just really a, a different scale more than anything else. I don't find any great differences. Thank you for the question. Yes, just over here. Good afternoon. I'm very interested in the uh, viral marketing point. It seems as though that was the, the, the key keystone to your success. What, what, is, what was that built on? What, why was your viral marketing so successful? Um, I mean, it took a long time to make it successful. So we did it because we didn't have a marketing budget. And we wanted to build, I was only interested in consumer websites because I'd worked in insurance for too long and wanted to get away from that. Um, so I thought, well, a consumer internet business is only exciting if there's millions of people using it. And the only way we can get to millions of users is through viral marketing. So I'd kind of heard of the term, you know, Hotmail was kind of maybe the first best quoted example of viral marketing and just thought, this is, this is kind of clever. If each person you can get two other people to join, you get four others, you get eight others, then you, you can get to millions of members and you haven't spent a penny on marketing. So that, that, just, that notion just really excited me. And so then I just sat down and just worked out, you know, how can you go about doing that? And so we, we, you know, it became apparent that you have to have an idea that is inherently vile. You can't make anything vile. Um, you're not going to make selling cow covered, um, cow skin covered sofas vile, you know. Um, but so we, we did the first site we did that was really vile was Birthday Alarm. And, and it just had this really simple vile loop, which was Birthday Alarm reminds you of people's birthdays. You don't know when your friend's birthdays are. You only know a few people's birthdays. So send them an email, ask them when their birthday is. They enter the birthday, ask them if they want to be reminded of their friend's birthdays. They say yes, and then ask them to invite, ask their friends when their birthdays are. So we just created this really simple VAR loop, and that just worked. And then it was trying about how to make that more and more efficient. So it, you, at every step of that process, you lose people. People drop off all the way through. You know, they don't click on the link in the email. They, they, the page doesn't load. Um, they don't want to enter their birthday. If they do, they don't want to register. They don't want to invite their friends. So you're always losing people. And then there's that one stage of that loop where you're inviting people, and that's the big multiplier. So you've got to get them to invite as many people as possible. And the, the thing that worked for us on that was the, the importing your address book. And so there was one other company. We'd sold our first company, Ringo, to a company called Tickle, and they'd had this feature on their site, and it didn't work for them. I don't know why it didn't work but they'd implemented this feature. And I saw that feature and thought, that's a really good idea. I'm going to put that on our other site. And so I implemented it. And at the time, we were getting about 10,000 members a day. And then 24 hours later, we got 100,000 new members. And on average, people were inviting 100 people to join. So we had a drop off. So you could afford to drop off 99% of your users through all those stages if they then invited 100, and you'd still be vile. Um, and so that, that was kind of the breakthrough point. And then we did that, and I thought we were, gonna, we were sort of scraping, not, not necessarily illegally, but there wasn't any formal agreement. We were scraping Hotmail mainly. 80% of our growth was through Hotmail, which was big at the time. 
And I thought, well, Hotmail are just going to cut us off because we're scraping them. We're logging in as the user. We've got the consent of the person who owns the account. They've given us a password, but then we're doing this login. And then they didn't cut us off. And I thought, it's any day this, this whole you know, fairy tale is going to come to an end. And it didn't. <laughs> it just kept going. And they still haven't cut us off today. And this is, that was in 2003. Seven years later, they still haven't done it. And now it's become, become standard practice. You see it everywhere. Uh, but I think we were the first ones to actually make it work. We didn't come up with the idea, but we were the first ones to make it work. Um, and so that, that was just kind of exciting, that ability to, to import. And it took about one or two years before anyone even copied what we were doing and added it. And I remember when MySpace added it, then you could see their growth was like that, and then it started going like this. There was an inflection point in, in their growth when they added importing. Was that simply because that the, the user could quickly disseminate the information across a bigger, a bigger group. Yeah, you could invite all your friends. So One go. the average was 100 people invited. Um, not, you know, that, that's not 100 people in the address book, 100 people actually invited. So if they invited one person, they would actually invite 100 on average. Obviously, a lot of people wouldn't invite anyone because they didn't trust the idea of putting their password in. Um, but that, that was the clincher, because I say it's that multiplication. If you say to someone, here's a load of fields, enter everyone's email address, then they go, they'll do a few, and they're like, this is kind of really tedious mm. and boring. I'm not doing this for like a few hundred people. So they just kind of give up. So they'll do a few, send it off, and then probably never come back. Um, yeah, the other thing we did prior to that was copy and paste a link, which you, you also see everywhere. Um, so you just say, take this, put it in your email client, and then <laughs> send it to everyone. So that would get us about 10,000 members a day. But then it, it stepped up by that whole order of magnitude when we did the importing. Right at the back. Hi, Michael. Um, uh, just a question about <coughs> talent, sort of US versus UK. I mean, you had another very, very high profile person, Joanna Shields, over here, who's an American, but US a Brit moved to San Francisco. Um, what's your sort of view on, on, on the difference in talent? I mean, do they make better entrepreneurs in the US? Is it better to set up companies over there? Or um, I, I don't think there's any fundamental difference in the ability of people. I mean, People always refer to the US as being very successful at it. I think the reality is that Silicon Valley is, and every other state's equivalent to the UK, they want to be Silicon Valley. So it's, it's kind of very much a Silicon Valley thing, not an American thing. Um, I mean, it's like anything when you've got a lot of people in, in one area and they're all doing the same thing, that there's a lot of cross-pollination of ideas and, and inspiration. Uh, I mean, Hollywood's kind of the same for movies. I mean. Hollywood is, is to movies what Silicon Valley is to internet startups and has been for, I, I can't remember when it was, 1920s, 30s, um, and it still hasn't changed today. And, you, know, you wonder whether it's ever going to change for Silicon Valley. But I think that the amount of talent in the UK is good, and I think the opportunity in the UK is that there's a lot of really good universities and uh, there's a lot of really smart people leaving university, and the problem is they want to go and work in the city and, and, and earn as much money in the short term as possible and they're not, um, they're not necessarily starting companies, but probably more <coughs> importantly, they're not joining other startups. So in Silicon Valley, almost everyone that leaves Stanford or Berkeley goes to work for a startup, uh, and that's the culture, and that, that's what they do. And certainly people from around America go to Silicon Valley to join a startup. And, uh, and here, um, people just don't think about doing that. And I think, yeah, entrepreneurs are important, but just having <coughs> that 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 feeder system of really smart people is the important thing. I mean, the most startups, small startups that do well, I mean, certainly the entrepreneurs and the founders need to be good, but they need to make those really good, smart hires at the beginning. And, uh, and there's no reason that in Britain that can't happen just as well as it does in America. As long as they don't move to Silicon Valley, of course. Well, that is a bit of a problem, yeah. <laughs> I think the fish and chips will prevail in the end. You're going to come back eventually. You're just on loan, aren't you, I'd have thought? Well, I come back for the fish and chips. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm here now. Um, yeah, I mean, ironically, I, I try and convince people not to go to Silicon Valley and to start companies here, and here I am, and I moved to Silicon Valley. But I have the excuse I married an American, and she made me go. So. <laughs> Thank you. It was, as you said before, so you, you want to hire people. It's about the talent as opposed to necessarily. Yeah. Just down here. Thank you. Michael, you've uh, described uh, social networking in, in all its various uh, shapes and forms, and now you're on to the new, new thing, which is uh, political networking. I wonder whether you could share your thoughts about that and how it might develop. Sure. Um, so there's social networking, there's business networking. I thought there has to be a third thing, and then I decided it's going to be political. So, uh, the, um, so w we're moments away from going live with that, and um, 
the reason I got excited about it was that I, I felt that there's a potential opportunity here that if you can get people constructively debating politics online and empower the people who are good at it, so let them rise within the community and have greater influence, then you can get some very constructive debate going on, uh, which can feed into newspapers and um, news organisations. And you can actually discover people who are very talented in politics. And it, it sort of came out from the original um, thing that there's not enough smart people in politics. I was having a conversation one night and we were talking about this. And you know, it's very hard to get entrepreneurs, <coughs> successful business people to dump that career and, and potentially go into politics. Um, and I, I guess I got maybe like many people a little disillusioned by politics and, and the process by which people get elected. I mean, you, you have a vote, but you, you vote for your local MP and your local MP has actually been chosen by someone else, not you, in the first place. So, you know, if you're Conservative or Labour, you only really have one choice, which is Conservative Labour. You don't actually choose that person. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted a way that we could surface people of note um, and, and, and encourage them to enter politics. So that, that was kind of the original goal. And then I thought, well, I, if, if what I know is social networking, why not do political networking, build a site? And I quickly came up with some, what I hope are good ideas on, on how that could be implemented, which will be revealed fairly shortly. And, um, and we'll see. I mean, it's fun to do. It's, it's the opportunity, if it succeeds, is very exciting in that the, the impact that it can have is huge. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of one of these people that once, once I've had an idea that I'm excited about, I find it very hard not to follow through on it because I'll, I'll question forevermore whether that would have been an amazing idea and uh, one that I'll never know, so I kind of need to know the answer. So that's kind of why we're doing it. Thank you all for being here today, and on behalf of uh, you all, Schroders and GP Pullhound, Michael Birch, I just want to say thank you very much indeed.